Hello. Good afternoon, Mabuhay. I am Teddy. And Dr. Vivian, do you mind putting in a presentation mode? Thank you very much. I am Teddy and welcome to the ASPA Flex webinar series. Pain intervention for a child with complex pain etiology is challenging. Frequently, we are faced with stumbling blocks along the course of the treatment that exacerbates the existing challenges. This afternoon, we are very uh, glad and very grateful that we are um, blessed with some experienced speakers. And before we start introducing our, uh, discussing the program, let me introduce myself. I am Teddy. I am from KK Children's and uh, Women's and Children's Hospital. I also from Ch Philippine Children's Medical Center. And uh, this afternoon, uh, our program, Dr. Vivian, thank you. Uh, this afternoon, with the help of our experienced speakers, we'll be sharing solutions to alleviate these roadblocks that we managed that we discussed earlier. We will highlight the importance of multimodal and multidisciplinary opioid sparing pain strategies, techniques for opioid rotation, and the value of integrative medicine for pediatric pain treatment and prevention. I also want to introduce my core moderator, which I've been calling for the past two minutes, Dr. Vivian. Dr. Vivian is the consultant and chief of service of Hong Kong Children's Hospital. How are you, Dr. Vivian? Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, uh, hi. nice. Great to hear that you are actually doing well. But before we start, uh, let's have some few house rules and gentle reminder. Okay, first thing that I would like to share that uh, that uh, you can ask your questions using the Q&A box. Yeah, there's a Q&A box below. Yeah, you can key in your questions. Your questions we can answer by text. And some of it, we will save it for the Q&A after every after talk. You just, if you notice, the chat and raise hand function are both disabled. So you just focus on the Q&A section. Okay, 
So like I said, our moderators will highlight your questions with the appropriate speaker during the panel discussion, but you should also stay tuned to the Q&A box because some of the questions will be answered by text with the appropriate speaker in the Q&A section. So if, for those who are actually asking for the certificate of attendance, it will be automatically generated and forwarded to those who submitted the post-webinar survey. The post-webinar survey will be forwarded tomorrow afternoon, exactly the same time as today, 5 p.m., through your email, so through your registra registration email. I would like to highlight to please ensure that you key in your name, your full name correctly, and your email because your full name, the whatever you, uh, full name you key in, that will be registered to your certificate. So if you just key in your first name and then only the first name will be keyed in, automatically key into your certificate. Yeah, so if for those who are asking for the video recording, you can actually, uh, you can follow us in our YouTube page. Uh, we have a YouTube, Asperplex. You can follow our, a like and follow our Facebook, ASPA 2000, or you can even check our website, official website of Asian Society of Pediatric Anesthesiologists, ASPA2000.com. All right, so having said that, uh, we will also have some polling question later. So if there is a polling question, okay, when we launch it, you will be prompted to answer the polling questions. And you have 30 seconds to respond and submit your answer. We will share the results immediately as soon as the end of the poll. And then as there is, and after the results right, is shared, you may close the poll so that you can see the slide shared by our speakers. So the, man, the, the, the closing of the poll will be manual from your end. Yeah. All right. So those are our housekeeping rules for this afternoon's webinar. So let's introduce our speaker. Let me introduce first. Dr. Dr. Katharina Isabel Epino, or Dr. Kim, as we may uh, all know her, Dr. Epino, is currently the uh, clinical associate professor and heads the pain management services at the University of the Philippines of the Philippine General Hospital Department of Anesthesiology. Uh, recently, she also um, just joined the Division of uh, Pediatric Anesthesiology at the Philippine Children's Medical Center intending to lead the establishment of the Pediatric Pain Service and Pediatric Pain Training Program. Dr. Kim took her um, fellowship at the uh, uh, Children's Hospital at Westmead, Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, and Concord Repatriation General Hospital in Sydney, Australia, where she was given a clinical lecturer status and uh, for her contribution. Uh, for the students, yeah. So a special inter her special interest includes pediatric pain treatment and prevention, palliative care, procedural pain, and education. Hi, Dr. Kim. Yeah, can you yeah, share your screen? Hello, how are you? Yeah, uh, if you can unmute yourself, it's okay. I think you're still muted. <laughs> okay, hi, Dr. Kim. Okay, yeah, we're waiting for Dr. Kim. Let's move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Serin Lim. Dr. Serin Lim is our senior consultant in the Department of Pediatric Anesthesia and Children's Pain Service at KK Women's and Children's Hospital in Singapore. She is our first, the first pain director of Children's <laughs> Pain Service in the KK Hospital. And she took her um, uh, fellowship at Boston Children's Hospital for pediatric anesthesia and pain, and then she also have a diploma course in acupuncture. Her special interests includes pediatric pain, cancer pain, pediatric sedation, holistic patient care, and then of course, for those who actually know her, she know we all know that she like uh, she's a very good dancer, and she's actually the social uh, person in our department in KK. Hi, Dr. Serene. Good afternoon. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. All right. Okay, Dr. Bibian, would you like to introduce the rest of our speakers? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, we are delighted to have uh, Dr. Janice Ng um, to speak on us on the first talk. She is the Associate Consultant and a Pediatric Pain Specialist working at the Hong Kong Children's Hospital. She is also the Honorary Clinical Assistant Professor of the University of Hong Kong. Her interests include pediatric anesthesia, pediatric pain, and pediatric sedation. So she is very experienced in pediatric pain management, and she received her pain, uh, pain training in Hong Kong 
as well as from the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne, as well as Boston Children's Hospital in United States. And with the uh, same talk, we have Miss Becky Shan from the Hong Kong Children's Hospital. She is a senior physiotherapist with passion in um, children uh, physiotherapy. She has a Master of Science in Rehabilitation in People with Developmental Disability. And her interests include pediatric orthopedics and pediatric oncology. And the last speaker in the first talk is Ms. San Fong. She's a senior occupational therapist with lots and lots of passion in the children pain management. Um, and her special interest uh, apart from in children and adolescent health, she also has interest in accessibility for people with disability. And her special interest and talent includes Chinese calligraphy. This is one of her artwork as well. Um, so without further ado, we will have our first talk on multimodal as well as multidisciplinary pain management for a very challenging case. Thank you, Tadi. Hi, um, thank you very much for the fascinating talk. Um, and we have a few questions on the Q&A. I would like to first ask our pain specialist on the questions about, about pain medications. So um, there is a question on buprenorphine. Can um, the pain specialist uh, tell us how you use buprenorphine for post-op pain? Um, buprenorphine is a, a strong opioid with partial antagonist effects. So it's basically used more for a, a in place of a strong opioid for post-op pain control. And uh, in my hospital, we have the preparation of sublingual, which has the advantage that um, if the surgeons do not want patients to take any oral meds, they can still take the sublingual buprenorphine with a good analgesic effect. Right. Um, there is also a question on uh, the use of the neuropathic pain agent, including amitriptyline, the gabapentinoid agent for um, periop pain. Would you routinely use for major surgery as preemptive analgesia? Would the uh, or we only choose for certain procedure? Well, I think I won't give it for every patient for, for these anti-neuropathic agents. So I probably reserve it for cases that have higher chance of neuropathic pain component or cases that has a high chance of severe post-op pain. For example, I think the case that definitely worth consider preemptive pre with those thoracic surgery. For example, they usually an open thoracic surgery. They the kids probably post up will complain of very bad pain, and so it would be quite good that you can start the uh, uh, anti neuropathic agents before the surgery. But usually for pre op, we will use the gabapentinoid group instead of amitriptyline. The problem of amitriptyline is the to get the full grown of the analgesic effect, you probably need two to three weeks. So usually I reserve the amitriptyline group into very selected group of patients and only when those post up when they have a very bad pain control despite I have been put on like almost everything. And usually they have a better effect on uh, improve the sleep of the child. The sleepiness and the drowsiness side effect of amitriptyline usually comes in on the first day. Right. So how about Dr. Katrina and also Dr. Lee, what would be your opinion 
on those agents for hurry up -ing. I think I typed the answer, yeah. uh, Serene. Oh, yeah. Hi. Um, uh, can you hear me? Um, yep. Generally, I reserve gabapentin preoperatively for like uh, the major amputations. Um, and I think perioperative use of gabapentin, we played around with it for a while. Clearly, it has to be surgery that justifies its use because if it's too short, um, then obviously post-op, they are a little bit sleepy. Um, so, uh, yeah, in amputees, uh, in these uh, major osteosarc cases, sometimes you do get pre-existing uh, pain that's quite severe pre-amputation. And I think, think in those cases, it's definitely indicated to have uh, gabapentin, be it like a week out from surgery together with opioids so that you get better control of the pain uh, without it uh, getting out of control. Yeah. How about you, Dr. Kim? Regarding gabapentin for this case? Yeah, I agree with um, the others. The use of gabapentin for um, amputation is probably the most that I use it for. Um, especially now with the onset of COVID-19, we've been getting um, late presentations of patients. So they really have um, large size tumors already that have invaded um, adjacent structures. So you know, for a start of it to begin with, even prior to surgery, they already have pain. I also use it a lot for um, burn pain management. We have um, we do have a burn center, a burn unit in our institution. So that those are my usual um, two situations where I use um, gabapentin, and of course um, the um, uh, the other um, painful um, uh, malignancies as well. If you say you're using gabapentin, what is the usual dose that you actually? Have? Maybe we start with Janice. So for this case, right, I understand that you started a pre-op regimen for this patient, correct? But can you do you mind sharing with us how do you actually prescribe the, the pregabalin for this patient? Uh, what's the dose that you well, have? Well, for me, uh, if I start gabapentin, I usually start at like five milligram per kilogram. Mm -hmm. And then for acute pay, patients, I might able to increase it by every day or alternate day by five milligram per kilogram until I reach a stage that patient is quite comfortable or they start start to experience quite bad side effect then I probably may stay there for a while. Yeah. So it's five milligram per kilogram per dose or per day? What, what I, I will go at five milligram per kilogram per day. Per day. And then see and then see their response. Divide that in separate separate when, when do you usually give do you give it at night? Or, uh, how about the frequency that you give it? Well, to start with, I usually start at that time or notice, and then it, when I increase, I may, in, for gabapentin, I may increase it to twice a day, but usually I will give a higher dose at night time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same, yeah. yeah. Right. So, um, yeah. Yeah. There is also like quite a lot of questions on the use of trimadol in children, especially under 12. I would like to ask the pink specialist about your experience of using trimadol in children. Okay, so, may <laughs> okay, so maybe I start first. Um, I noticed that um, from, uh, there are very um, change in the practice of use of tramadol a couple of years ago since FDA and also the Europe uh, start to publish warning about uh, careful use of tramadol in children, especially those aged younger than 12. And uh, this is probably mainly because of this drugs has a pharmacogenetic variations between individuals. For those fast metabolizer, who has enzyme that are fast metabolizer, those pa patients are has particular risk of having a sudden high dose of morphine inside their system after they take tramadol. That's why there are uh, precautions of giving tramadol in children. However, when there is tramadol, although this is only a moderately strong opioid, However, it's, when compared with strong opioids such as morphine, it has an extra benefit of, it also works for neuropathic pain. 
and that's why um, I will use it for children when there are neuropathic pain. However, I would use it very cautiously. I usually start it when it is inpatient that we have adequate monitoring and also I will observe the response of the kid and usually I will start at a low dose and see how their response. Right, thank you very much. Um, I would also like to ask Becky and San about pain assessment. In your practice, do you find that there is often quite a lot of discrepancy in terms of pain assessment between the clinician and uh, allied health who has to make the kids move around and do activity? Maybe I answer first. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I, I would not say it's very different. Like for this girl, before the operation, it's so obvious that she's in so much pain. I think um, everyone agree that it's a high level of pain intensity, and then we don't really mobilize her out of bed a lot. But for after the operation, honestly, because my our focus is not just um, handling the pain. So we try to get her mobilized. We try to get her um, more active. So the direction of my treatment and my questions, I usually, I don't mention the word pain to them. Like when I go to her, I would say, how are you feeling today? Are you feeling okay today? So I never ask how much pain you feel today. So if she actively tell me that, oh, I'm, I'm so painful, I don't want to come out of bed, then I know it's truly painful. If she said, it's it's okay, we can go to have exercise. And I know she's like, maybe somehow painful, but not, not that painful. And uh, I think quite often when I see them from the gym and in the bed, I think they present just totally different. If there is something that they want to engage and uh, they are motivated to do so, and uh, they don't really actively complain of pain. If they don't mention the, the words of pain, I never ask. Like uh, when we put them on, um, uh, processes like when she started to try to walk if i saw her limping or twisting or resting a lot more frequent then i know there's some problem but i still i ask do you want to rest uh, why you want to rest like they will say i'm tired or maybe i feel a little bit pain and this is a time when she mentioned the word pain and then i will ask is the pain like mild or is it severe so uh, sometimes there is all cases that they really complain of a uh, phantom limb pain during walking like he will say like when I put weights on my stump I feel like my fourth and fifth toes being crashed by a car and then I know that it's really like huge pain that they are walking with the prosthesis then I think it's a problem I need to tackle but sometimes they will say like I feel my legs is there but it's not limiting me from walking around and then I will just like uh, keep an eye on that but I will not stress on the pain pattern and I think quite often because I ask them in the gym like I try to separate to ask them and their parents because I, I think quite often the parents concern will affect the child's answers like if I ask do you want to try to go to toilet and then the kid said yes but the father said no it's going to be too painful for you to walk to the toilet then the kids will say yes it's too painful for me to do so so I think um for kids, sometimes the pattern varies quite a lot, even with different environment. If you bring them out to the park, if you bring them to play TV games, if it's mild pain, like mild to moderate, they, they usually think that's not that pain. But if you ask them to do things that they doesn't want to, they don't want to be uh, doing dressing, they don't want to have body weight measure for the nurses and things that they don't want to do, they will just simply tell that, no, I'm too painful to do that at this moment. So I think, um, it's maybe a little bit different because our direction is I try to get them mobilized. If, if I ask, are you pain? And then they said, yes, I'm painful. And then I have to stop. So uh, it stopped me from doing anything. So I never asked them, are you feeling pain? I just asked, are you feeling good today? Do you want to join me in the, the gym? So I think this uh, might be a little bit different from the right. uh, pain assessment and then the focus of treatment. Brilliant strategy. Yeah. How about you, Sunny? Okay, um, for this uh, little girl, it's a little bit different. I agree that um, uh, as we are uh, using the same um, um, tape to measure how pain it is. So we have the, the most important thing is whether they understand the scale. Um, for this kid, 
uh, Vivian asked me for help. It's obvious that um, there is something blocking between, I mean, the communication. There is something wrong. So I, um, first of all, we usually assess the um, activities of daily living, the basic self-care, even if the basic self-care that they cannot tackle. So what's the problem? It is really the phantom thing that limit her a lot. Um, I can remember that once uh, when I want to sit on the bad side, uh, on her right side, and then she suddenly swept away. That it seems that I'm sitting on her leg. So that is very, very obvious that uh, we have to help the family and her to understand herself. She uh, really not very understand that. The whole family uh, are very um, introvert, I can say. They always, um, I mean, they keep on saying that uh, it's around two, it's okay, it's okay, but at her, this is not okay. So then uh, I give her that um, the, 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 the time schedule when there is attack, you have to mark them down. And then I uh, actually, I have tried all the scale, the pain scale, show them which one. We spent two days to um, finalize uh, uh, using the ultra scale instead of the usual um, numeric uh, rating pain scale. Because um, with, the, with the photos, um, the father can, can imagine how pain uh, the little girl is suffering and the girl is really facing what's inside her. So um, for that particular period, I mean that three to four months, in addition to the numeric uh, rating pain scale, we also use Oucha. Um, this is not, uh, we are not going to use the rating, uh, I mean the, the, the tampon scale, but in addition to that, the Oucha is the reference for the whole family. And um, uh, this is really obvious that when, when they always saying that two, two is really no, nothing. There's something, something bordering, but um, the patient is really able to adapt to the pain psychologically and with medication or devices um, such as cushions. But obviously, this is not that case. So um, back to back to Vivian's question: um, Is it um, obvious, uh, not uh, usually, that there is a discrepancy between clinician and um, uh, our assessment? No, some uh, usually they are they are um, um, coherent. But uh, we still need to respect particular patients' um, perspective of the pain. And that's why we, uh, we must work in a multi multimodal. Thank you very much, so, Sunny, and thank you very much, Becky. For, and of course, I congratulate the Hong Kong Children's Hospital team for a brilliant management of this patient and very successful control of pain. So in the interest of time, OK, let's move on to our next topic. So let's say, for example, we are in a situation, almost similar patient, but about a bit older, about 12 years old. However, this patient, if it's, we are in a situation we're in, or there's an increasing opioid usage, and you are developing side effects from the opioids, what strategies or solutions that we can actually use? So our next speaker, we will call back Dr. Kim, Dr. Katrina Isabel Ipino, to share another technique, which is opioid rotation. Dr. Kim? Good afternoon. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. I'm here um, this afternoon to talk about opioid rotation for complex oncology patients. So even if these are complex oncology patients, I'm hoping I can make it um, as simple as possible. Okay. Going straight to the case, this is actually um, just a spin-off from um, the case that was discussed earlier on. So this patient is a 12-year-old, 30 kilogram, who had hip disarticulation from an aggressive osteosarcoma. Um, unfortunately, the surgical site was complicated with infections, hence multiple dressing changes and backs were done under general anesthesia. So the analgesia that was chosen for this patient was a PCA morphine, with one ml being equivalent to um, 20 microgram per kilogram with an infusion rate of 1 ml per hour and a bolus dose of 1 ml per bolus. 
However, at this point, um, sorry, so the maximum hourly dose limit was set at 8 ml per hour, plus, of course, some adjuvants to hopefully decrease the opioid requirement. Um, furthermore, more unfortunate things happening. Two weeks following repeated change of dressing, there was an observed increasing trend in morphine usage. This time, um, this child was already maximizing the hourly dose limit that was set for her, which was an 8 ml per hour um, limit. And her pain issues included there was minimal relief um, for the sharp pain that she felt at night. And um, she was already having presumably side effects from the opioid medication. So she had nausea and the mom notes that she was drowsy, but still cries in pain when she is awakened. So the team or the acute pain service um, decided to switch her to fentanyl. All right, so just some basics. What does opioid rotation mean? It is merely switching from one opioid to another or changing a route of administration. So the aim is to improve the therapeutic response or and reduce side effects. Um, however, it relies on expert validated equi-analgesia ratios in um, tables. The World Health Organization actually makes no recommendation for or against the practice of opioid switching or rotation in um, adolescents, the age of our um, patients. So what's the indication? When do you... Um, when do you decide or when do you consider opioid rotation as a possible option for your clinical management in a child who is in pain? So opioid escalation causing intolerable side effects. So that's one, tolerance, hyperalgesia, a change in clinical state. So there may be changes in organ systems. Um, the route is at, it, of administration is no longer feasible or applicable, meaning, for example, the child was progressed in terms of diet and is nearing discharge and is already ready to be um, transitioned to oral medications. Or, unfortunately, say, for example, a child um, required an NG insertion and can no longer take medications orally. So an intravenous route might be more applicable in that situation. And also, especially in our situation, opioid avail availability and cost is also one of our considerations or indications in terms of opioid switching. I just included this decision tree. I just thought that it might um, make it a, a bit more um, easier to see or come up with a um, diagnosis or a differential diagnosis as to what's happening with a child. So in our situation, we have opioids here. We didn't do dose reduction. Instead, we did dose escalation. And with dose escalation, um, a decrease in pain was observed with multiple boluses. So that tells us that maybe she's more likely having tolerance rather than opioid-induced hyperalgesia or withdrawal. And the options for further management um, include addition of adjuvants or regional analgesia. However, that's not the scope of um, my discussion today. So we proceed to this particular part, which is opioid dose escalation or the use of alternative opioids or switching to another opioid. All right, and just to share um, this, I always think that um, knowing what the mechanism underlying um, certain clinical situations or observation is important so that our management becomes tailored as well. So we are looking at opioid tolerance for this particular child. There is a decreased drug efficacy and likely a desensitization of new receptor to opioid. So the clinical picture is the pain is overcome with opioid dose escalation in her case. Um, in her case, um, increasing the boluses, um, increasing the boluses to relieve her pain. It's just that she was having more of the side effects. Tolerance to many opioid side effects, but not central apnea or constipation. So these are the other symptoms, which we do not have information of for this particular patient. And then, so further considerations before um, switching from one opioid to another, a careful patient assessment is very important, I think. Um, consider the age as well. Um, process differential to support your decision and using the most appropriate um, drug class 
specific for the mechanism or the um, pain complaint. And then um, the clinical scenario or the clinical state of the patient. And then also I would suggest um, consider um, racial difference or ethnicity um, in assessing response or predicting response. And then dose reduction, and I say dose reduction, how much do you want to decrease the dose when you have converted or switched to another opioid already? And very important and um, very practical um, is to do post monitoring after um, switching. And then titration, of course, to avoid overdose. And we also don't want um, withdrawal. All right, so what does opioid equivalence mean? It's simply means so synonymous with the analgesia, approximately equal um, analgesia. Doses of various opioid analgesics that are estimated to provide um, the same pain relief. Okay. However, the listed analgesic um, equivalents are mere estimates. We still have to take into consideration individual um, patient variation. In um, the standard that's being used um, in these Opioid equivalence tables or opioid equivalence charts is a 10 milligram intravenous um, morphine. So how about um, cross tolerance? What does um, how does it come to play? Um, cross tolerance is a concept. It's it's developing or the development of tolerance to the effects of pharmac pharmacologically related drugs, particularly those that act on the same receptor site. So when switching in this situation, when switching to another opioid, assume that cross tolerance is incomplete, which means that the starting dose of the new opioid must be reduced by at least 50% of the calculated equi-analgesic dose to prevent overdosing. So always safety is our priority. All right, next. What about relative potency? I just included this. Um, also for um, historical information. So relative pot potency is the ratio of opioid doses necessary to obtain roughly equivalent effects. So these are determined through clinical trials comparing different drugs and routes of administration. Um, so we are able to calculate for analgesia or any uh, measurable non-analgesic effects of a drug or an opioid. Hence, from here, we can convert, these can be converted in, into equi-analgesic doses by applying a standard. That's why um, morphine was established, morphine 10 milligrams IV was established to be the standard. So the, these estimates are also necessary to meaningfully investigate the comparative effects of different opioid drugs. And also, um, um, determine the clinical relevance of non-analgesic effects. And um, so these can be compared with rough equi-analgesic doses. The studies previously of relative potency have been the foundation for a better understanding of many issues in opioid clinical pharmacology, as well as if they have been the basis of the equi-analgesic um, doses or tables that we see nowadays. All right, so this is an example of an opioid equivalent um, table. This is what I'm used to. Um, this is what's being used at the Children's Hospital at Westmead. It's part of your pain management guidelines. So for me, it's fairly um, simple. It has all the medications um, that are available in my particular setting, especially here locally. And it also gives me, reminds me of the oral bioavailability as well as um, duration of these tests. All right, so let's just do some practical stuff. So say, for example, in our patient, the um, compounded solution is a morphine PCA with one mil or one ml being equivalent to 20 micrograms per kilogram. And because of the escalating pain, um, the infusion rate was up to 2 ml per hour, so that's equivalent to 40 microgram per kilogram per hour. So just for our trainings, I just doubled this. And then from the um, case vignette, we, we know that the um, early dose limit that was set initially was um, 8 mil. 
So that is equivalent to 160 micrograms per kilogram per hour. Now this child is um, 30 kilograms, so that will end up to be 4,800 micrograms or 4.8 milligram per hour of morphine. And if you multiply that by 24 to get the um, daily requirement, that will be 115.2 milligrams. All right, fairly um, straightforward. Now, um, going back to the case vignette, the team or the um, app, the acute pain service, decided to do an update switch to um, fentanyl, assuming that it will um, still be a PCA since this is already a 12-year-old child. Um, fentanyl PCA, 1 ml. Um, this is the concentration that I'm used to. Again, so it's 1 microgram per kilogram. And to come up, with um, the dose, the conversion or the converted dose. Remember that um, um, all equivalents, so most of the equivalents, sorry, all of the equivalents in the table that I showed earlier is against morphine 10 milligrams IV. So we have 115.2 milligram total requirement in a day. So I just divided that by 10, which is the factor, and came up with 11.52. And then the dose of um, the dose equivalent of 10 milligram morphine IV to fentanyl in that table that I showed you is 250 micrograms to 500 micrograms. So that will end up being 2,880 micrograms of fentanyl in 24 hours. If I divide that by 24 hours, I get 120 microgram per hour. And divide that again by the child's weight, which is 30 kilogram, I end up with four micrograms per hour. If I use the 500 microgram equivalents, I will end up with eight micrograms. I usually just do um, compute for the bigger conversion as well. So I know what dose range um, is available for me. All right. So now, um, counting for incomplete cross tolerance, this will be the proposed PCA um, setting. So similar preparation, the infusion rate will be one microgram per kilogram per hour and the bolus will be one microgram. So 50% of the four microgram per kilogram um, computation is two microgram per kilogram. So I was hoping that I could get it with one bolus plus the infusion kit. And then for the lap out, you have an option. Um, most institutions would say five minutes um, just for this situation or this particular patient. Since we noted that she was quite drowsy, I included 10 minutes. So at least you know that there's an option to do that also. And the limit is set at five micrograms per kilogram per hour. So again, um, fairly um, straightforward uh, computation. I just um, wanted to show these to you as well. So I've looked at um, different epi-analgesic doses, opioid conversion charts, epi-analgesic dose table. This is one of the oldest ones. So this is in 2004 by um, Notnova and um, Portinoy. If I use um, the conversion dose, sorry, the equivalent that um, they um, placed in their table, I would end up with 576 to 1,152 micrograms of fentanyl a day. And if I use this one, this one is from um, Stanford, their um, pocket guide. So there is 15 microgram for chronic patients, 100 microgram for acute and single dose. All right, so since this patient is already has been on opioids for um, more than two weeks, and she is also a cancer patient, we don't know at this point, but maybe she has been on opioids or pain medications as well. She might have had existing pain preoperatively. So I decided to try and use a computation of 15 microgram per hour or to use this conversion chart. And this is what I ended up. Now, if we use this one as the ANSA um, opioid calculator, so without decreasing or without accounting for cross tolerance, so this is the dose that I am 
ended up with. 50% reduction is this one, so it's 865. Now, this particular conversion chart mentions this website, Open Calculator Practical Pain Management. So I tried that as well. And I ended up with 1,152 micrograms. So what am I trying to um, get at? So different um, charts, different tables, different open conversion um, tables and charts. So again, in these six, those apps, you might end up with um, different doses. So it's very important to um, consider the entire picture, including the clinical situation that the patient is in, um, and those other considerations that I mentioned earlier. All right, I just wanted to show you this. This, um, this is a review done by, I think this, this was a French group who did this review and they just wanted, so they reviewed um, available information out there on um, equivalence and opioid equivalence. And this is what they came up with. So very varied and it's actually different. Um, it's not always um, bi-directional, the um, conversion, the equi-analgesic doses that are available. So say, for example, let's take this morphine IV converting to fentanyl um, transdermal. Okay, so um, for morphine IV to fentanyl transdermal, it's actually 28 is to 1 for lower doses of morphine IV. But for higher doses of morphine IV, it's 48 is to 1. And then, for example, um, from morphine oral to fentanyl transdermal, um, so Another, um, so there is also a range. There's no fixed um, value. So it's really um, varied. Okay, so having said that, there are limitations. It doesn't mean that we don't have to use these. It still remains, I think, to be a good guide, but it's more importantly, I think, is to use um, what's available in your institution to have just one, if possible. So at least everyone is on the same page. So the early relative potency assays did not describe other estimates like time to meaningful effect, peak analgesic effect, or duration of effect. They actually, what they did was they summed the pain scores and averaged them. And they did not assess other potential factors influencing potency, including direction of the switch from one drug to another. It's not always um, bidirectional. The influence of chronic administration, especially in um, patients who have malignancies and those at the time of change. So that's also very important to consider. And then the responses based on ethnicity, advanced age, adjuvant medication, and comorbidities were not taken into account also. So these are the same, um, almost the same as those that I have listed in the considerations earlier. All right, so I hope um, that uh, helped somehow. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kim, for that very informative talk. Okay, but before we proceed uh, with our uh, Q and A for our viewers, uh, we will just launch a poll. Okay, so this poll is just a short exercise, just to test whether, uh, whether um, how experienced our um, our uh, viewers in terms of opioid rotation and if they have tried this before. So just sharing the case to everyone is a 12 year old, same 30 kg. Currently, if the patient is on morphine infusion, uh, 20 mics per kg per hour, right? And then if you are going to convert the morphine infusion to oral morphine syrup. So that what dose of morphine oral syrup should we prescribe for this patient? So while waiting for our um, viewers to answer, give them some time to compute this math problem. So I have a couple of questions to Dr. Kim. Dr. Kim, uh, you mentioned um, different sources of tables and equinalgesic conversions and all that. You have Stanford, you have ANSCA, and you have the app. So in your practice, which one do you actually use for your practical, uh, you know, when you actually do rounds and you convert patients and rotate patients in different opioids, which table do you actually use? Yeah, in our institution, we're still in the process of um, 
like coming up with our own guidelines specifically for the um, pediatric population this um, the philippine general hospital is a mixed population hospital so we have um, both pediatrics and adults but currently my go-to is still the one um, from the children's hospital at westmead it's just personal choice just because I'm so used to um, using it already having been in that institution for over a couple of years and having seen that it has worked and kept um, patients um, safe as well. I use um, the ANSCA opioid calculator as well sometimes to cross check. I use it um, for adults um, also. Yeah, so that's so why um, I said it's more of um, using what's available to you, what you're familiar with. And if there's one um, that's available in the inst entire institution, so everyone's on the same page, that is probably one step um, forward already towards um, additional patient safety. Yep, I agree with that. I think uh, more importantly, regardless of which one you use, is something that is institutionalized. That everybody is same page and everybody is using the same uh, uh, table for uh, computing for equinalgesic dose. Um, and, um, another question before we go back to our poll, uh, let's say for example, Dr. Kim, I am your resident and we are doing rounds and you're giving me some instructions for a patient similar to this. So if you are going to give me some uh, uh, instructions when do I convert a patient? You mentioned a certain indications earlier on, but if I remember just three things, right, out of those laundry lists of a consideration, what is the most three most important thing that I should remember uh, to decide whether should I convert this patient from opioid to from let's say morphine to fentanyl or from morphine to oxycodone? Yeah, yeah, I'd say maximize the use of adjuvant as well in regional anesthesia, analgesia, um, and um, peripheral nerve blocks if possible, especially in our institution where um, there are only two, um, two opioids, that's only fentanyl and morphine that patients can access for free. So we really have to conserve um, and maximize and try as much as possible not to reach opioid tolerance or um, hyperalgesia. And um, second is um, uh, you do, um, it, it, it has been used, opioid rotation or opioid switching has been used safely um, for patients um, who, who have um, poor pain control already from existing opioid medication and um, intolerable side effects. And then three, and what I'm very um, anal about is monitoring, especially after um, starting. So one, induction or starting of new medication. And second is after, um, after a switch. I would be asking um, trainees, pain rotators, or our pain fellows to be going back um, frequently to the patient to um, assess. And now um, because of um, the surge in COVID, we make use of phone calls. So we try to call um, parents, um, companions in the room to limit, um, to limit the visits as well. So yeah, I think those are three. Yeah, thank you very much. I will remember. <laughs> I'm sure our trainees and residents who are viewing and fellows uh, will remember those three. Uh, yeah, going back to the poll before we answer another question, I think um, just sharing it to everyone. I end the poll first, right? Then I will share the results. So if you notice, um, 39%, okay, uh, answered 3.6 milligrams every four hours. Uh, next to that, 32% answer 7.2 every four hours, 20% answer five, six hourly, and 9% answered 4.5 milligrams, six hourly. Dr. Kim, what is the answer to this question? It's 3.6 milligrams um, every four hours. Yeah. Yeah. So I think majority of them got it right, but uh, can you explain a little bit how we managed to reach for the 3.6 milligram every four hours? Yeah, sure. I'm opening up my calculator, manual calculator, not an opioid calculator. So we start with the patient's weight, which is 30 kilos, and multiply it by 20. So we will end up with 600 micrograms. 
and then come up with a 24-hour um, dose requirement. So multiply that by 24. We will end up with um, 14,400 micrograms. And we want to convert it to um, milligrams. So divide it by 1,000. And we end up with 14.4 milligrams. Um, considering the oral bioavailability of morphine, we multiply that. So 14.4 milligrams multiplied by three. So we'll end up with 43.2 um, milligrams. Owing or considering cross tolerance, I'd go half on this dose. So divided by two, we will end up with 21.6. And um, take into consideration the onset of action in um, the as well of morphine, um, we divide it into um, four hourly doses. So divide that by six and we end up with 3.6 milligrams. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. I think most of our viewers got it right. Yeah, Dr. Vivian, you have a question? Um, yeah, we would also like to ask the panel for the opinion of um, converting from intravenous morphine to buprenorphine or whether you recommend it or not. Yeah, I think based from the case that we gave uh, the first one, right? First case, yeah. Maybe J Dr. Janice can answer. Well, if the patient has any reason that do not tolerate IV morphine, then my first choice of rotations probably would be oxycodone instead of buprenorphine as oxycodone is a orally available and well-tolerated analgesis, which is also a strong opioid. Mm -hmm. However, uh, in selected case, I did once have a patient who can't tolerate the PCA morphine who got severe nausea and vomiting with it that I end up start the kids with buprenorphine sublingual and find that the, the child's no longer got nausea and vomiting and the pain is very well controlled. Mm, I see. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Janice, for your point of view. In the interest of time, we will move on to our final uh, uh, talk for this afternoon. Uh, the final talk actually aims to answer the question, what completes the healing process in a child in pain? So uh, let's, let's welcome back Dr. Serene Lim as she's shared her thoughts regarding integrative medicine. Thank you. A very good evening to everybody and thank you for staying back late this Sunday evening to listen to my talk um, on integrating integrative medicine in chronic pain. I'd like to thank the ASPA Educational Committee for this invitation and I've learned a lot uh, preparing for this talk. Um, I work at KK Women's and Children's Hospital which is just a 830 bed hospital that's shared between women's and children's. My special interest in the is in the management of complex uh, pediatric pain, especially oncological pain and difficult uh, sedation and weaning challenges. In the years that I've worked here for uh, the last 20 over years, one thing stands out that's very important and paramount and that's the physician patient connection. Um, without it, um, everything becomes technical, and this makes a difference, especially in complex pain. Conventional medicines may be important, but they can be um, very ineffective in the challenging chronic pain, and true healing has to address the health of the mind and spirit as well as the body. So holistic care needs to embrace the family unit, um, and it is important to know that uh, like characteristics like hope, patience, and love, even though they might be quite cliche, are actually paramount and can move mountains. 
The four pharmacological methods that we have are standard therapy in our hospital, uh, the psychological um, CBT, ACT, mindfulness and compassion, as well as mind-body activities um, with referral to CHAMPS for play, music, art um, therapy. Um, and all these things uh, are no longer um, uh, considered like uh, CAM in a way because they become part of conventional therapy. So in my talk today, I'd like to cover what's integrative medicine, a little bit more about what complementary alternative medicine is, um, and some working models of integrative medicine, a bit about placebo effect, and if we have time, uh, just very brief clinical vignette of some of the CAM uh, apply applications that I've managed to uh, do in my career. So what is integrative medicine? This is IMED. Um, a holistic approach to medical therapy that combines um, the best of conventional medicine or standard therapy with complementary alternate medicine, alternative medicine, which is a non-standard therapy. So the trends of CAM use is on the rise globally, especially in the USA. Um, and it is uh, really a very lucrative business. The US expenditure was $34 billion. There are a lot of ethnic and cultural differences um, in it. And in Singapore, uh, obviously the Chinese race are the largest users of CAM, the traditional Chinese method, followed by Malays and Indians. Um, there's ironically greater CAM integration in US than in Singapore. Um, and that is uh, evidenced by a lot of education and hospitals that actually provide CAM services in the US. Um, and I will tell you a little bit later about the models of integrating CAM. Okay. Um, when uh, this study came out, uh, even though it's quite an old study, there were already 38 institutions or so 86% offering one or more complementary and alternative medical therapies for their patients. <clears throat> How do patients um, uh, 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 look at CAM? In a study in uh, uh, pediatric oncology clinics, um, which surveyed 137 families, overall CAM use was 60.5%. Um, and ed associated with uh, educated parents who had already experienced CAM practice itself. Um, the thing to highlight is that a high proportion may not discuss the CAM with their oncologist, which is an important thing. Um, there must be transparency so that there may not be any potential for adverse drug interactions. So complementary alternative medicine is actually uh, defined by National Center for CAM or NICAM uh, as a series of alternative uh, medical practices. Um, and they comprise alternative medical systems, which embraces TCM, which is um, Chinese, uh, the Ayurveda in uh, Indian Ayurveda and Jammu. They are also biologically based uh, treatments and mind-body interventions, manipulative uh, body-based methods and energy medicine. And if you um, want to have a look at how comprehensive it is, it seems like an ever-growing list. But the thing that is really uh, interesting and applicable to our clinical care, especially acupuncture or acupressure, uh, as well as the uh, the use of uh, hypnosis in the, the management of pediatric pain, especially pediatric cancer pain, um, and also uh, some manipulation of uh, the diet, um, some mineral uh, and nutritional supplements, as well as um, the, the possibility of massage and aromatherapy where the evidence is a little weaker. Um, obviously, at the center of, of wellness versus disease is the biocycle social triad. And in chronic pain, this is very important, especially the psychosocial aspect and the emotional uh, and behavioral aspect. So um, obviously, as far as conventional medicine goes in terms of uh, reaching treatment goals and uh, alle alleviating symptoms, it sometimes seems to take a backseat to what some of the CAM services provide. So what are the goals of uh, integrative medicine? It's just psychosynthesis of the mind, body, and spirit. Basically, it's a reset button which uh, tells the brain uh, to reprocess how they actually uh, view and behave uh, 
with respect to pain. And obviously chronic pain and cancer forms a big stress and assault to both mind, body and spirit. Um, obviously goals are wellness to alleviate pain and suffering and to restore sleep and function. So the obvious checklist before embarking on CAM is to uh, know what the therapies entail, um, know what evidence that supports their use and some of the benefits and side effects. When to start therapy and when to stop therapy or give up and it is important to use only accredited CAM. So the CAM focus of my talk is actually uh, acupuncture, hypnosis, massage, aromatherapy, diet and supplements and I'll try to answer these questions on the right as I go along. So acupuncture has been around for thousands of years and it's not um, uh, something that is uh, unfamiliar and the NIH has already concluded that there's a clear body of evidence with respect to its efficacy in various clinical conditions. So um, what is acupuncture? It is the art of inserting fine needles at acupoints and manipulating them, either with electrical stimulation or manually or with mixibushion, to improve the flow of qi, which is a life energy, thereby restoring function and balancing yin and yang. Uh, this improves health and alleviates pain and symptoms, uh, even curing disease. And basic philosophy for pain and disease in TCM is bu tong chi tong, tong chi if it's blocked, there will be pain. If it's not blocked, there'll be no pain. So the goal of acupuncture is to restore the qi, improve circulation and health. And this can even uh, relieve pain, itch and edema. The acupoints are actually located uh, by measurements and anatomical landmarks and they lie within the myofascial plane. The exact depth and correct spot is heralded by, heralded by eliciting the de qi sensation. The qi is basically a sensation of an ache, which is swan, numbness, ma, heaviness, zhong, and distension, zhang, which can be felt around the needle as it is inserted. Depth of needle also depends on patient size, acupoint location, and um, traditional, there are three types of acupoint. The usher acupoint, which is the yes ouch or the tender spot. Extraordinary acupoints that don't lie along the classic uh, meridians of the uh, viscera, according to the Chinese TCM anatomy. And meridian acupoints, which are specifically located along the uh, meridians, which are imaginary lines joined by the acupoints running along the surface of the body. There are 12 uh, channels um, of which half are yang and half are yin, the yang being on the dorsal. And the units of measurement are the standard for each acupoint being, uh, and the yardstick of measurement is the patient's own um, uh, body part or like finger rather than a ruler. Uh, even though it's in twin or inches, that twin is in relation to the patient's body part. This forms a network which conflicts the body's um, energy, where energy flows, and there is no energy, and this energy flow stops in death. Obstruction leads to a block chi and disease. So acupoints are in every living uh, um, organism, um, mammalian. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure about fish, but okay. Um, and uh, it's hard to uh, reconcile uh, TCM uh, philosophy and anatomy uh, with the Western traditional medicine sometimes gives you a hard gives me a hard time uh, when I was doing the acupuncture course. But there have been a series of studies which have uh, used ultrasound um, to have a look at the relationship of the acupuncture points and meridians to the connective tissue planes, and there seems to be um, an eighty percent correspondence where there are intramuscular or intramuscular uh, fascial plane. Um, uh, intersections on post-mortem dissections and there seems to be an integrative relationship uh, with the tissue and the surrounding milieu um, and the mechanisms how it works um, it's a, a complex thing that's not just local it involves the uh, uh, secretion of neurochemical um, 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 
um, substances like endorphins, serotonin, acetylcholine, um, and also has a bearing on neurological processes, for example, gait control. Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm going to skip through some of these, except to highlight that the acupoints are actually um, demonstrably uh, points where they are low resistance and high conductance. When you put an acupoint locator or a probe, you can actually hear the electrical um, sound change. Um, and these are some of the benefits of acupuncture, including um, increased oxygen uh, consumption, blood and lymph circulation, um, helps to have healthy, uh, beautiful skin, which is why there is cosmetic acupuncture as well. Um, the technique, um, there are various techniques um, and essentially you insert these, uh, now they are disposable sterile uh, needles, hypoallergenic needles, and you can actually have electrical stimulation or you can warm it um, with the warming needle, uh, or you can actually have a needle in underneath cupping. There are also needleless alternatives, which are actually um, better suited to pediatric practice. Um, you can have probes uh, that are either electrical or just uh, the metal probe like up above here, and there are studs that you can use. Um, is it true that acupuncture is a problem in pediatrics because of needle phobia? Uh, as early um, uh, as uh, 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 Yuan Chi Lin from Boston um, actually uh, published this quite a while ago about acupuncture and needle phobia, the pediatric patient's perspective. And actually, prior to treatment, they were severely afraid, but later on, they actually were not so afraid of needling. So it is actually the approach um, and education and getting used to it. So that should not be a deterrent to acupuncture. Um, the indications include symptom management of nausea, uh, ameliorate pain and chronic pain, relieve muscle tension, improve circulation. Uh, it's not san sanctioned by our uh, MOH and HSA for autism and uh, the recent uh, RCA uh, publication of the RCA trials also supports this. Um, it's very important uh, for pediatric acupuncture to be skilled at it. Um, and my teacher at the TCM Institute uh, was really, really amazing. Uh, his needles just flew like this. It was like a Kung Fu movie. Um, and I'm not sure that uh, I would have the courage to um, do that without uh, much um, a clinical experience or the numbers to prove. It's like maintenance of skills. It's not for the occasional uh, acupuncturist. When you do ultrasonography, um, dry needling, by the way, it's not really acupuncture and it's useful for myofacial release. So um, I think Lashmi Vas did this a long time ago. Uh, she used ultrasound to determine what happens when you do dry needling. Uh, and it, she has had very good results uh, with her CRPS patients. So both dry needling and acupuncture do work in pain. Um, the philosophy of uh, Acupuncture is a little bit difficult to wrap your head around. Um, and although there's a lot of emphasis on evidence-based literature, I'd just like to point out, like for example, um, the use of ultra-low-dose ketamine and in, the, in pain work, it's very impressive clinically. I mean, if you look at the literature, it's not so impressive, but it's really impressive. I can of um, apply an ultra low dose infusion in the morning and by afternoon, the patient is pain free. So there's a lot of problems with all these uh, big, big um, acupuncture research because there's so much heterogeneity. It's quite hard to prove um, uh, a lot of things, even though uh, the, the level three evidence seems to support it quite well. But when you look for level one in evidence somehow it just doesn't seem to get the impact that it uh, it may deserve. So my next chem therapy that I'm going to talk about is hypnotherapy. Um, this is guided hypnosis and the subject should be willing, should be able to relax, cognitively able to concentrate and listen to instructions and follow instructions like controlled breathing and having a good imagination helps. So what is induced is a calm trance-like state, which is an altered state, uh, uh, and much like dissociative 
uh, anesthesia, uh, with a heightened focus and concentration that allows the subconscious to respond to instructions, answer questions, and uh, find memories that are suppressed or hidden. There are different types of hypnosis, and obviously, uh, as the therapist induces hypnosis, there should be testing to affirm that, that the patient is indeed in a state of trance. And some of the outward uh, signs of trance include change in body warmth, fluttering of the eyelids, lacrimation and eyes living back. So one of the useful applications of hypnosis is actually the magic glove, which is a hypnotic pain management technique developed by Dr. Leora Kutna. And it's pretty effective, you know, for um, somebody who is quite uh, uh, on the uh, disbelieving actually of hypnosis when I went to the pain master class we broke into groups of two to try it and it does work but you have to be able to concentrate and be immersed in the imagery so there's preparation for hypnosis there has to be uh, uh, inducible uh, a, a nice conducive environment which is calm quiet and um, there should be uh, comfort. It shouldn't be uh, a place where there's a lot of light and interference. And as the hypnotist, the vocal modulation should be low and soothing. And um, these are some of the induction techniques where there's repetitive um, uh, uh, requests to concentrate and relax and imagery. Um, the benefits Yes, there's no uh, issues with toxicity. It's cost effective and it's uh, been calculated to cost an average of 722.71 cents less than the other CAM therapies. What it can do is restore confidence, build positivity, overcome fears and reduce anxiety, improve satisfaction with life and improve sleep and well-being. So its applications are also apart from procedural pain and IV setting, um, so can be applied to some dental pain, procedural pain and cancer related pain. And there's also the magic dial where you tend to dial down the pain. That's quite a good imagery to share with your cancer patients. Some of the interesting research findings, especially by uh, MP Jensen, who's done a lot of publications, is there's a high degree of variability in response to hypnotic analgesia. It's helpful with respect to sleep and comfort. But the benefits of hypnosis go beyond pain relief. Um, and even though... Uh, patients may report a pain score that's the same without any reduction, they are reportedly satisfied with the therapy. So some of the implications from clinical trials um, suggested are uh, to target both immediate and short-term or and also long-term pain relief. So an example of what uh, they would say to the patient would be, your mind can easily enter this state of comfort and the comfort will stay with you for minutes and hours. The more you practice, the easier and more automatic this will be. And the longer and the beneficial effects will last. So um, there should also be tandem uh, suggestions for benefits other than pain reduction, for example, and you will have a great night's sleep tonight, you know, and it um, also to boost confidence and also uh, lessen emotional upset. So there are actually uh, multiple benefits to hypnosis um, to enhance treatment outcomes and expectancies. Hypnotic inductions are actually associated with brain change. Uh, consistent with uh, those that happen with pain relief, uh, decreased beta and increased alpha frequencies. Um, there's substantial reductions in pain scores that can be maintained for up to 12 months. And this uh, hypnotic analgesia influences pain processing at multiple sites um, that uh, respond to hypnosis, uh, like in the insular prefrontal cortex, thalamus, and cingulate gyrus. <clears throat> Basic approach to hypnotic focus analgesia or HFA shows promising results. And the proposal is to actually have the standard induction include a focus of attention and suggest uh, for uh, an alteration in the subjective experience of pain to downplay the pain so that it's not such a uh, looming, uh, fearful uh, thing. And also uh, to have sufficient time and uh, sessions, uh, each session lasting 20 minutes and four to seven sessions with uh, backup 
uh, daily practice at home for self-hypnosis. Other studies have shown that fMRI um, scans indicate that the subjects without this hypnotic focused analgesia when exposed to pain stimulus actually complain of the subjective presence of pain, which is marked by that um, brain cortex lighting up in the sensory areas corresponding to pain, which is absent in those who actually have HFA done. Okay, so these are some of the uh, things that uh, hypnotherapy works on, cancer pain, headaches, especially temporal mandibular pain, and uh, in cases, fibromyalgia. Are there any risks? Uh, not really, but uh, substituting false memories may be at risk, and it's not really recommended in those with psychosis or personality disorder because that can get worse. It's important when you do hypnotherapy to explore boundaries and intentions and explore where there are no-nos, absolute no-nos. And on CNN, uh, Hypnosis Real or WAC, there was an issue with a, a hypnotist uh, Ricky Kalman, because one of the subjects actually had was a germaphobe. He was actually uh, really averse to shaking hands, and the hypnotist made him shake his hand. So he was really upset after that. So all these things need to be uh, uh, worked out. And uh, studies have uh, supported the use of hypnotherapy in the reduction of pain. Massage is a little bit more. Uh, uh, difficult to pinpoint because there are different types of massages and different qualities of massages and anybody who's ever been for a body massage will tell you that the massage therapist is paramount of paramount importance so the different types and techniques include swedish and indonesian which involve oils and the dry massage which is thai reflexology shiatsu and there are others specialized massages targeted at the problem areas like sports massage, deep tissue re uh, release, and lymphatic drainage, acupressure massage, trigger point, and, and uh, others. There's also recently uh, a lot of baby massage coming up, and some of the uh, recent uh, reviews and studies have actually supported um, this as those babies that actually uh, had baby massage gained weight faster. Okay, so some of the benefits of massage are increased blood flow, increased oxygen, um, and it's actually the human touch. There are also uh, cardiovascular and autonomic changes. Um, there's a predominantly uh, ten there's a predominant tendency to get into a parasympathetic state, which is a more relaxed state. So massage has also been found to be better for aiding muscle relaxation following exertion. And the NCCIH, uh, which uh, allows um, sharing of these uh, uh, contents as long as they are acknowledged, um, has actually looked at the reviews in massage therapy for health. And what they find in low back pain uh, is that it's useful for acute and subacute um, back pain, but may not be so useful for chronic pain, although there might be some weak indications that it's helpful. In terms of neck and shoulder pain, um, there is uh, evidence that it does help uh, in the pain relief. Um, and in terms of osteoarthritis, uh, that, that it, it's also uh, fairly helpful um, and also in headaches. So um, the other things that it, massage uh, may be useful for are in fibromyalgia, HIV and infant care. For HIV, uh, it's uh, helpful for depression. Um, you know how we tend to feel good after massage and um, for fibromyalgia, uh, two systematic, uh, uh, two, 214 systematic review meta-analysis um, concluded that if it's continued for a sufficient time, it improved pain, anxiety and depression uh, symptoms, but did not have an effect on uh, sleep disturbance. So evaluating the different type of massage uh, for fibromyalgia, most of the massages had a beneficial effect on quality of life, except Swedish massage, perhaps because they did not reach the, the painful points. Okay, um, when you do fMRI, again, here's another uh, tool for uh, being a little bit more scientific and in pinpointing what works and what doesn't work. Um, it, it's quite interesting that there are benefits and the brain does light up uh, uh, after a single section of massage treatment. What they found actually is that when uh, the default is to have the brain 
engaged um, at a resting state uh, to get a better signal uh, difference. So these patients had their right foot massage whilst in the MRI scanner, uh, but prior to that, they were giving a cognitive task to perform and they had either Swedish massage, reflexology, or massage with an object. Um, and actually, all these massages um, did make a difference in the signal, but reflexology was the one that maintained uh, the, the signal at the same areas during resting state. The other need, needed to have that cognitive task uh, being performed to have that. Aromatherapy has even less supportive evidence, although it does smell good, um, and it's useful for sleep, relaxation, circulation, and all that. One thing to bear in mind that when you are working with young children and infants, uh, it might actually uh, cause a lot of irritation, for example, peppermint which the adults use. Um, these are the different uh, formulations for sleep, pain, circulation, and end-of-life agitation. Uh, obviously, inhaled um, aromatherapy, um, uh, it, it can be uh, um, a very pleasant uh, thing to have at the end-of-life uh, care when your room is uh, uh, like dark and unpleasant. Uh, in the hospital, it just makes a difference um, to the environment. So the mechanism of action is actually also to the brain. The problem with um, these uh, aromatherapy uh, treatments is that it's ephemeral. We know how uh, instantaneous and effective like music and smell of the, these senses, they straight away permeate um, a lot of layers of your consciousness and they can trigger memories. Uh, they can trigger mood and, and uh, emotions. And different types of aromatherapy that there are the cosmetic, massage, medical, olfactory, and psycho, uh, ther psycho uh, therapy, aromatherapy. Um, in terms of diet and supplements, there's really a lot out there. I just like to highlight that in a lot of chronic pain patients, there's a deficiency in vitamin D3, and it's good to, in your practice, um, assay uh, those levels. What diet and supplements can do is they can be anti-inflammatory uh, and that helps with pain. Some can be analgesic, some help with sleep relaxation, and some boost in immunity and bleed detox. So these are some of the uh, dietary supplements uh, and they can be used in fibromyalgia, headache, and in joint pain. Um, so it's like I said, one thing that's key, apart from just using CAM, is communication, rapport, and, build, and building a relationship on trust. And just talking and having the time to deal with your pain patient is also important, where you can sow suggestions and ideas and positive influence. Um, okay, integrating CAM, um, there is a model to translate it from idea to practice. Basically, you have hypothesis and protocol generation, presentation and evaluation by um, the hospital board, acceptance and integration. So, uh, and then trial runs in whichever uh, area you want to integrate it at. And there are three different models where CAM is fully integrated, like a lot of hospitals in the West. They actually have a CAM specialist and they offer the service in the hospital itself. And, uh, uh, if you have enough people around, then there will be a huge movement and support for CAM. In co-opted integration, you share the same roof and premises, but uh, work uh, autonomously. That means um, you work separately. Um, this is pretty much like in KK, uh, where there are TCM services uh, in the physically in the hospital itself. Um, the disadvantage is that it's uh, less immediate um, in terms of access. Um, and it's also less transparent. There should be actually communication between the um, uh, physician as well as the CAM uh, therapist uh, for the best outcome for the patient and safety as well. Then when there's no uh, integration, then a patient has to leave the hospital and go outpatient to seek CAM services. It's less convenient and also communication is even worse than when there's co-opted integration where uh, one can actually uh, walk down and sort of like get to uh, uh, talk to the, the physician in, in charge. Okay, so a leaflet of our KKH experience is very limited. Um, I, I have actually done an acupuncture uh, diploma, but I 
I am a little bit low to practice. As I said, you need a lot of skill and expertise. Um, so I actually did acupuncture on myself. And when I had frozen shoulder, um, it's quite obvious that different acupuncturists that I go to have a different uh, impact on the pain that I felt. So, um, okay, so just a little uh, vignette about KK. There was an eight-year-old Indian boy with persistent post orchidopexy pain. So after a lot of evaluation um, and we, we started in, on um, the standard therapy of paracetamol uh, and SAIDs and some uh, mismorphine PRN. Um, then we decided that this, this was not the way to go. And then I offered acupuncture. So what happened uh, to him is when I offered acupuncture, he asked what it is. And I said, it's involved, it involves sticking a lot of little needles into you. And then straight away, his pain got better. And then uh, we didn't hear from him anymore. So that's, uh, uh, that's quite a um, <laughs> humorous account. Then there was a teenage girl uh, with musculoskeletal non-organic foot pain, um, no history of preceding trauma or injury. And this girl actually had, uh, I gave her a, a old bass oil, which is basically something with eucalyptus tea tree. Um, and it actually, after showing her a few acupoints and rubbing around the sore area, she was well with, within two days and she was discharged. Um, a nine-year-old Chinese boy with a petoblastoma ascites on 10 liters per minute face mask oxygen was deemed palliative terminal. He had uh, orthopnea. He was actually a, at rest dysnic. So he was a challenge. Initially, he was actually on a PCA, um, bolus only. And then um, after dialoguing with the oncologist, he was deemed uh, proceeding to end of life. And I suggested uh, a TCM uh, consult. Um, by one of the uh, reputable uh, physicians. And this actually resulted in his uh, SITs subsiding and he actually got well enough to be discharged. Unfortunately, he came back with a uh, um, very cellar sepsis. He had caught chicken pox uh, from outside when he was home. He had a reprieve of about two months at home, which was really quite nice. So out of these leaflets, I have a positive outlook uh, towards CAM. I'm not like those uh, physicians who absolutely um, dismiss it as uh, voodoo or hearsay. There's definitely something that can be had. I think we need to keep an open mind. We need to individualize care and uh, persist in our multimodal approach. Um, concentrate on pain reprocessing therapy. And it is a transformative medicine that transcends bar barriers. So keep listening, keep trying, keep learning and proceed with a lot of love. Thank you. That's the end of my talk. I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Dr. Serene, for the very informative <laughs> talk. And we have learned quite a lot. Two um, minutes more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Divya, <you> <laughs> Um, thank you very much for everyone <laughs> and for the panel. We have lots and lots of information. We learn a lot. Plus, we also respond to a lot of uh, questions in the Q&A box. So um, you can pay attention to that. Just one very quick question for the panel. Um, for the uh, CAM, it is so um, so good and there are so many options. Who should lead this service in a tertiary hospital? Maybe let's start with Dr. Serene in KK, who's the lead therapist for CAM. <laughs> okay, um, so I think there usually is quite a lot of um, things to work out. For example, if I wanted to start off an acupuncture service, I would have to present that the literature, you know, supports it and decide which patients, which age group, how we're going to do it. It's not a problem setting it up because in, in the sense that you can get your needles, your uh, the equipment, but the problem is actually the staffing. I think it's very important to have very good or skilled acupuncturists. And I was actually eyeing uh, my teacher, but he's so popular that he's not interested. So I would be loath to start off that. Um, if you're talking about policing CAM in the country, uh, HSA does that. So all the TCM physicians, all the acupuncturists, and all the TCM medicines are, are actually, uh, you know, Singapore, it's actually very well policed and monitored. So we don't get um, 
if we get uh, illegal cam stuff, it's like over, uh, it's under the counter. It's kind of like uh, illegally from uh, whichever country that they fly in and secretly bring in. But by by law and by right, it's very well uh, um, policed here. So every single product that it's uh, on the shelves, uh, there is a joint committee. So people who have been my teachers, so um, the TCM physicians in China are doubly qualified. They actually do a Western medicine course, which I think is very good. And I think it's lacking in uh, us when we do like conventional medicine and we not all of us do a TCM course. So uh, that's that's good. Um, uh, so there is a collaboration between uh, the TCM where uh, Institute where I actually trained in just to do acupuncture for that herbology and that sort of stuff. So it's quite integrated. I think where it's best illustrated is in the Amokyo Community Hospital, where it's used uh, regularly and extensively to uh, for stroke rehab, where it's definitely proven to improve circulation and recovery. And, you know, so does that answer your question, Vivian? Yeah. Yeah, actually, yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Serene. I uh, for giving us providing us information how we practice cam in KK in particular. How, just very quickly in uh, Philippine General Hospital, Dr. Kim, how is cam being uh, practiced? So we do have um, acupuncture. There's um, a, an anesthetist who has been doing that even I think um, before the pain clinic was organized. Yeah. And there's also one who's a family medicine physician. And in a couple of group practices that I'm part of as well, there are two, there are pain specialists. Yeah, so who, it's a family um, in-house, yeah. basically. Yeah. Yeah. How about in Hong Kong Children's, uh, Janice? For acupuncture, currently, I think it's done by our physiotherapist. But due to the registration of the hospital so they can't do it like COVID, regularly COVID period, right? it's of the pandemic. yeah yeah maybe can you hear me sorry yeah, yeah. 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 yeah maybe yeah. i maybe Becky. i say man a little bit sorry mm. i'm on the street um <laughs> i think in <laughs> actually in hong kong okay. there are a few people that can do acupuncture which is a tcm and a physiotherapist so the policy i think is uh very depends on the different hospitals. Like um, in Hong Kong Children Hospital, we are allowed to do needles as long as uh, we have close um, like discussion with the mother team, like on the team I do, like oncology patient, if they have a special concern on the blood, like they have low count, we do not do needle mm. acupuncture. Yeah. And there is some hospital, not our hospital that do not allow to have uh, real needles. Mm. So we, it really depends on individual uh, hospital mm. policy. Mm -hmm. But um, I think clinically, it's uh, worth to try acupuncture, mm -hmm. and especially in teenage, like uh, we do have some patients, they actively ask for acupuncture, mm -hmm. and uh, we have like soft tissue tumor after RT, they have a uh, lot of soft, uh, soft tissue healing problems, and mm -hmm. uh, we also have a few cases that they are terminally ill with palliative care and a diffuse whole body pain, they don't want to have a... Uh, too many painkillers because they mm. feel like nausea or dizziness of the side mm. if they want to stay active and um, they actually ask for acupuncture um but i think so younger kids i find it uh, a little bit more difficult like uh under 10 sometimes they may not uh, cope with needles so well so uh, we usually start off with massage and uh, acupressure or even acutans before if if they really think that help uh, we, we sometimes try a uh, dry needle but not that often Thank you very much, uh, Becky, for that information. I think in the interest of time, I would like to thank all of our speakers. I would like to thank the team, Dr. Janice, Sane, and Becky, and from Philippine General Hospital, Dr. Kim Epino, and of course, from uh, KK Children's, Women's and Children's Hospital, Dr. Serene Lim. So for those, uh, just a gentle reminder for our attendees, for your post-webinar survey, it will be delivered tomorrow to your email at seven at 5 p.m., uh, wherein it will auto-generate your certificate of attendance. We will also like to invite uh, everyone, uh, next slide please, Dr. Vivian, yeah, for our next webinar. Uh, no, so if for those, the videos who wants to watch the recording of this video, you can visit our website, like us in Facebook, or follow us in our YouTube channel. <laughs> and of course, for those who are waiting for our next uh, 
webinar. So it will be in February 20, same time at uh, uh, 5 p.m. So the, uh, our speakers for our next webinar will attempt to discuss and share with you the expertise in making pediatric neuroanesthesia safer. And we will also like everyone to save the date over 14 to 16, 2022 in Istanbul for our ASPA 22, 2022 conference. So from here, we would like to thank everyone for listening and thank you everyone for staying with us. And thank you to our speakers and to our viewers. Maraming salamat po. Maraming salamat po.